Hey guys, so this is the video for how to solve the chapter 6 homework problems. Uh, just as a reminder, it won't be graded because I'm going to give you the answers here. It's a really good idea to do the exercises first and then compare with the answers rather than just looking at the answers, okay? Um, so, the first one is about the Balmer series. And we did kind of an example of this in class already. Um, so we're going to use the equation... It's called Rydberg's equation. Uh, with Rydberg's constant, I'm going to round here because I don't need that many significant digits. Okay, so 10 to the 7 meters inverse. And for my n1, I'm going to choose to put 2 there because it's got to be the, you know, you want this fraction to be th this subtraction here to end up being positive. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, well, there's supposed to be a bracket there. I can't write it because I ran out of screen space. But All right, and so 1 over lambda is still there. Um, all right, so this part doesn't change. All right, and so 1 over 2 squared would be 1 quarter, and 1 over 4 squared would be 1 16th, right? And I'm just going to do this math, and we get 0 0.1875. There's no strict number of significant figures here because this is kind of a counted value. So is this. So I'm not going to worry too much about sig figs for this kind of question. It's not a measured number anyway. That's why I don't care. Okay. So then I take 0 0.1875, and I multiply it by Rydberg's constant, and this comes out to a really big number. I guess um, I just I'm gonna write in scientific notation. Okay, and that unit meters inverse is still there. To solve this for wavelength, I'm going to do the inverse. So one divided by two point oh six times ten to the six meter inverse will be lambda. It's the same as as you know multiplying by lambda and then dividing by the number. Um, so from this we get. 4.86 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. All right, but the question is asking for frequency, so that means I have to reference another equation. This one, um, C equals lambda nu. That's supposed to be a V. Let me write that again. It's hard on the iPad, but there we go. Uh, I can rearrange this. When I have lambda, I can, I can solve for frequency, so... The speed of light is just a number. I'm going to divide it by lambda to get frequency. Okay, so the speed of light is a constant, so it's just a number. You'll get that on the test. Uh, and it's going to be divided by the wavelength we just found, which was 4.86 times 10. Uh, meters. So the meters cancel, and we're left with inverse seconds there, which is the same thing as a hertz. Um, so, put that in the calculator, and it says 6.17-ish times 10 to the 14. You can write seconds inverse, or you can write hertz, which is hz. Okay, so that's our frequency. To figure out what color of light this is, that tells us it's in the visible spectrum, because outside the visible spectrum doesn't have color. So that means I want to convert it from meters to nanometers. That's usually how we, the, the, the unit that we typically use. So I take this, oh, hang on. I'm gonna take this number of meters and I'm gonna convert it to nanometers. So nano means small, right? So I'm gonna have a lot of small things in the big thing. A lot of you mixed up this kind of conversion on one of the other homeworks, but if I'm trying to get to nanometers, it goes on top, and there's going to be a lot of them. So it's a positive exponent there, not a negative one. Um, so that's what we'd have. Or you could also do one nanometer. So one of the small things would be a small fraction of a meter. Okay? It doesn't matter which one of these two you do because you end up at the same place. Try it out on your calculator. Take 4.86 times 10 to the negative 7 and then multiply by 10 to the 9. 
you'll get 486 nanometers. Or if you take the same number and divide by 10 to the negative 9, you still get the same number, okay? So these are the two conversion factors. Nano and pico and micro, all of those are smaller than a meter. That means there's a lot of them in a meter, okay? So pick one and stick with it. Don't try to switch these exponents back and forth. You'll get, you get confused by it. Okay, so if our value here is... 486 nanometers, that's that's toward the blue range, so our light would be blue. Okay. So that's number one. Number two. Okay, so magnetic quantum number is the one we said was M sub L. Magnetic quantum number, M sub L. Okay. A 3p orbital has an energy level n equals 3. That's what the 3 means. So that's your principal quantum energy level. That's like the Bohr energy level, basically. The p tells us... So if it has n equals 3, it means the m sub l... Well, actually, sorry. Before we can figure out m sub l, we have to figure out the l values, the angular quantum number, right? And so um, n equals 3 can have a value of negative 2. No, no, wait, sorry, not negative 2. It can have a value from 0, 1, or 2. So your m sub, your n value dictates the total energy level. Your l value is the shape of the orbitals. Okay, so that's the shape. And so these numbers correspond with s P and D. And of course, an energy level of 3 does not have any F shape orbitals, so they're not going to come up here. So what this boils down to for the L value, the L value is equal to all the whole numbers that you can get up until n minus 1. So from 0 all the way up until n minus 1. Okay, so that's how I remember that. In this case, this particular one that we're given is a 3P. So it's the third energy level with an L value of 1. Okay, now we can figure out what the M sub L value is going to be. It's based on the fact that it has an L value of 1. So angular quantum number can be anything from minus L all the way to positive L. So if we have a minus Oh, we have an L value of 1. That means I can go minus 1, 0, and plus 1. Again, only whole numbers, and 0 does count. So our angular quantum number here is going to be these three values, minus 1, 0, plus 1. That's why P orbitals have three boxes. They each correspond to being on the same energy level. So this would be like a 3P energy level. They each have individual shapes, sort of, well... They're all the same shape. They're all shaped kind of like that. But they're oriented in different directions. So each one of these angular momentum numbers corresponds to a different direction. That answer is number two. All right. So when we think about um, p orbitals, one of these boxes is, let's just say, let's draw them color-coded. Let me clean this up real quick. So one of our, our, let's just say, for instance, our positive one value it has a green color here. This is totally abstract. Of course, orbitals aren't actually colored. But let's say that that one is oriented in an up-down kind of direction, like a horizontal orientation. Um, the next one, the zero value, would be purple, and it could be oriented in sort of the horizontal direction like that. And then finally, our last m sub l value would be oriented coming in and out of the page. So really, what it would look like from this perspective is kind of the end of the balloon. We don't really draw it that way because it doesn't look quite right. So typically, people draw the one that's coming out of the page and going into the page at kind of a funny angle like this. Um, so that would correspond with your third box on your energy diagrams. All right, so these m sub l's, these angular momentum numbers, correspond to the direction in space. That's, there's three of them because there's three axes on this particular 
orbital. Okay. Number C, letter C, whatever that is. Sketch a 3P orbital. Oh, well, that's pretty much what we just did right here. Okay, so this is your answer for three, uh, number 2C. The thing that makes them different is the fact that the 2P orbital would be smaller than that. So, like, if we were going to draw a 2P orbital, let's say, um, it would actually be, like, contained. I'm just going to do it for the green one, not for the others, because it'll be um, confusing if I try to fill them all in, but... You can imagine that if we filled in the 2p orbital, it'd be a smaller thing. Same same kind of shape, though. It's hard to draw on here. But um, it would just be like two smaller lobes inside of the 2p. And the red one would be the same, and the purple one would have a smaller lobe inside of it as well. So the thing that's the same is the shape of a p orbital is consistent. The thing that's different is that it's larger as you get a larger energy value. So, number three, this is about electronic structure. All right, so we're looking at astatine, which has the chemical formula AT. Write the shorthand electron configuration. Okay, so longhand means we start all the way at hydrogen on the periodic table and work our way all the way to whatever element we're interested in. Shorthand means all I have to do is find the element and go back to the nearest um, noble gas before it. Okay, so let me show you this. Okay, so here's our periodic table, and I find AT right here. Ooh, that looks terrible. Let's make this black. Okay, we find acetine right here, right? So in order to figure out the core electrons, that means the electrons that don't react, they're too close to the nucleus, what we do is we trace all the way back the periodic table. I wiggled. Let's try that again. All the way back, we jump up to the last noble gas before it, and that's going to be xenon. Okay, so I'm going to write that down first. And I put that in brackets. The brackets indicate that it's core electrons. They're electrons that can never be taken away in a reaction. Okay, and so then from here, we got to go forward from xenon. So here's xenon. We counted all of the electrons xenon has. Those are the core electrons. Now we have to say what these electrons are. So of course, group one and group two are the S block. I remember that. And it's gonna have principal energy level of six because it's in period six. So we'll go back and we'll write six S. Now there's, we have to go through two different boxes that are in the six S. So we're gonna write two electrons. That's a superscript. Okay. Then it says, here comes the, the weird ones that you got to drop down, right? On our periodic table, there's not a big space there. It just has kind of like a little bar. But you can follow it because of the, the numbering. So 56 is BA, and then 57 is lanthanum right here. And then we go all the way through before we jump back to hafnium. That's how I know how to number these things. One of the confusing parts is because the energy levels jump down for the F block, which is this one. And for the D block, the best thing to do in terms of organizing my electrons is to just follow the, the periodic table. And so we go all the way across um, the, the lanthanide series to do this, right? So we go from 56 to 57, and then 58 and 59, so all of these. I can count those boxes, and there turns out to be 14 boxes. Okay, so that tells me there's 14 electrons in that energy level. It's an F block, so it's shapes, the shape is an F orbital. And then finally, I know the F block jumps down by one. So if this 57 belongs here, that means the principal quantum energy level is going to be four. And it's the F block, and there were 14 electrons there. Okay, I'm going to scooch this over so I have some more room. Okay. Um, let's see. That brings us back to hafnium, right? And then we got to go all the way across this, which is the D block. So that's 10 electrons, and the D block only jumps down by one. So we're in period six. That means that's going to be energy level five. There's 10 electrons there. And then we have to get, oh, I didn't make it all the way. There we go. And then I have to get through the P block. This is the P block. So we got one, two, three, four, 
five. The P block, the period matches the energy level. So we would go um, six P five.